Hello, everyone. This is Shane Gibson with Racken, and welcome back to another meetup for Digital Rebar Provision, uh, meetup number 34 on Tuesday, February 26. Welcome. We've got a nice contingent from community on board with us today. Uh, today, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, a pretty major uh, refactor on the uh, portal, and there's been a huge rewrite in the back end uh, for managing the portal code base and capabilities and features. Rob will talk to us a little bit about that. Uh, I'll give a little bit of an ESXi uh, demo with some of the new content cleanup and work I've done recently. And then we will uh, talk about Ansible use cases and feedback. Uh, we've had some questions in community recently about use of Ansible and Ansible roles uh, with the old uh, Ansible content pack that we've had. Uh, things have changed a little bit, so we'll talk about the changes around all of that and uh, oh, in the meantime, we've got on board with us from Raka and myself and Rob. Rob, do you have the rest of the team there with you on? They're yes, <laughs> they're not on camera. Yeah, so that's Greg Greg and Victor are on uh, as well, um, not on camera, but uh, in the background with Rob. So that's most of the Raka and team there. Uh, in the meantime, I'm going to turn things over, Rob, and let you do some discussion on the portal uh, UX refactor stuff. All right. Hey, what? Yay, yay. Um, boy, I'm not sure where we where to start. I think we did a little bit on this before, so I will try and keep it brief, but um, hit, hit some of the highlights and if people have questions, please, please uh, interrupt me. Um, well, yeah, the, the portal was based on, when we started with the digital rebar provision pieces, we started with React um, and it was an eight, 18 month old version of React. So we upgraded that and added uh, some continuous testing infrastructure on top of it to try and catch things um, in our build process. And in, the pro in, in doing that, that actually gave us some um, new promise capabilities. If you don't know React, it doesn't mean anything. Um, but it means that when we make calls to the backend API, we can do them in parallel more easily. And so most, most functions in the UX even though it's not obvious as you click through things, um, have been parallelized dramatically. So uh, a screen that has a lot of activity in it, like, mach like machines that basically touches every other model, is going to generate a huge amount of calls, but those calls are now parallelized just so that you get a lot, the data becomes a lot faster. Um, the other thing, one of the things that, to note in this is if you're used to using bulk edit, we had a, a bulk screen for logged in users. That capability has now been merged into the machines page. So bulk, the, the features of bulk, which is being able to set things in bulk, will still require you to log in, but the machines view will now include all of the things like the handy widgets and menus and stuff like that. And then the bulk screen has been cleaned up a bit so that from here you now have run is simple, actions are simple, but now profiles, um, workflow stages, BMs, and uh, this will ultimately be parameters, can be set on machines. And then if you're used to this screen, um, this, is a really, this is a really fresh um, install. Um, then what, one of the things that you might have uh, found frustrating is that you couldn't set profiles in it multiple profiles in at the same time. In this case, you can now set multiple profiles uh, and it'll figure out how to do that. Or if you want to remove them, you can remove multiple profiles at the same time. Or if you want, you can just force fit the change uh, for all profiles and it'll go through and, and make those changes for you. Um, and just like before, everything we have is going to, you're going to get live updates. So as things are made here, you'll get some some notifications about it, but um, the changes will actually be made live into the system. So if I wanted to start a different workflow, um, like start CentOS install over here, put some stress on my machine, you can just click the button here and it'll start going through that process and you'll get live updates as it, as it does that work. Uh, in this case, it's rebooting my, my system, so it'll be paused for a little while. Um, 
And then within the machines view itself, uh, not too many, there's still some bugs I'm cleaning up on rendering, but um, this is, this for the most part has been the way it's supposed to be, uh, or it hasn't changed that much. Uh, some small cleanups. Uh, the biggest thing you'll notice, especially if you're in a larger uh, site, is going to be a it's going to be a lot faster from that perspective. Um, and then the other thing we've done is really change this how this view operates. Um, so you won't get the wizard will close itself, and then the the content differences when 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 it the system inspects what you've got and gives you recommended upgrades, um, that screen's going to be more compressed. And it's also going to be based on the new racking catalog. That's actually its own shame. That's its own topic. Um, yeah, that would be a good uh, future meetup topic. It's the whole catalog stuff. I know Greg's got a little bit of work he wants to do on polishing and cleaning it up and should be ready before next meetup. Yeah, there were some, in the last meetup we talked to. No pressure. No pressure. In the last meetup, we talked <laughs> to some enhancements that we made to the CLI that lets you pull things directly out of the catalog. Um, so there's there's a chain of, of deployment capabilities that are enabled by that. Um, but this is the design here is to make it faster and easier to see what things you have. If something's up to up to date, it'll be green. If there's an upgrade or a, a delta available, uh, it'll show you an arrow. Uh, in this case, there's clearly something not right because these don't need upgrades. Um, and then if you're doing licenses, what you're going to see is you will see for the UX, how many, how many machines you can host for the UX until you're a customer. That's uh, controlled from the server. And then the details about your licenses. One of the changes, if you're not familiar with this, it's worth mentioning. Uh, we're, we're rolling out a license change. We've rolled it out. Um, we just haven't publicized it that much where uh, you can, uh, click the license button, self-generate a license that has basically any, any of the modules we have in the catalog um, we're able to download. So that's what prompted a lot of the UX changes. In the UX, the catalog now um, merged plugins and content, since that was confusing people. Um, and that whole, I have to go to another page to get content, uh, get catalog items. So in this case, it takes the catalog, the online catalog, which is just a big JSON file, and then it shows you options for the catalog. So if I wanted to add something in, uh, like the development library, I could pick a version that I wanted to, to take, and then I could download it. Uh, oops, and there, yep, there it is. These cards move around a bit. Um, and then I can download them and, and change it. And same thing is true if I need to remove, remove something that I didn't want in my System, I can go, I can click remove and remove it. So if I want to burn in features, uh, most people don't want to capability. They're just going to want to take in, bring in um, uh, you know, the current release. And so if that, in that case, I can literally click a button and it's going to download and pull in that capability uh, for me. And one of the things we've done is there's actually a lot more in the catalog. Um, so if I start clicking these buttons, you can see different things that. That are that are have been made available over time. There's quite a bit of it, especially when you click in the lab, the lab view, start scrolling off the, the screen for those those features. Um, and then if you don't want to see the catalog at all, of course you can you can only see what you have installed. And then we have uh, there's some internal data stores. Um, so a lot of the, these are all features that were in in before. We're just trying to streamline the process for how you get your content. Um, and since there's a licensing change, anything that you see here, um, you'll be able to get a, the trial license and then download and play. Your documentation might be missing, especially in the lab. We're completely, completely uh, missing. Um, but uh, basically, that this is all, now uh, all you can eat sort of license buffet. Uh, other things of note um, in here that, that's pretty important is. The system, oops, the system is going to um, not have that default login button. Let me show you what that looks like. So uh, if I log out here, log out. Um, what what you will find is there is no default button, and if I 
Um, if you log in, I'm not, I'm not doing it. I changed my password. If you log in um, into the system, it's actually going to prompt you to change your password. If you haven't changed it yet, we, we, we really want to make sure that if people are using the system, we're making it easy. There it is. Um, making it easy to, something busted. Uh, sorry. To figure out what's going on. A little, um, bit of, little bit of code cleanup required. Yeah, there, no, so. this, is, this is something we just added the password. So one of the things that you can do from the UX that you weren't able to do before is change your password. Um, and I, I literally, I wasn't thinking about the demo, so I pulled in some code that I, I shouldn't have. Um, but literally the users, from the users, you'll be able to modify your, your password uh, for yourself or any user. So trying to tighten up the security so that default, you know, rocket skates, uh, password is not floating around on everybody's endpoint, unless that was your choice. And then nag you about it if you do that. Uh, all right. And then there's some new stuff coming that we will we'll talk about in future meetups with the site endpoints manager. I'm not going to even click around there because that's a advanced feature. You won't see this if uh, you won't be able to access it if you haven't installed the plugins for it, which is normal. Wow, all right. That's the way UX goes. There's tons of refactoring in the background, and hopefully, most of the screens don't look any different. In, any more on that, uh, Rob? Or we want to kick it over to community. Is there any questions from community on changes, enhancements, updates? Look, I'll, um, I'll hopefully, questions. Yeah, I was just going to say, hopefully it doesn't look too alien in changes. It shouldn't. Um, a lot of the refactors just back-end code, some minor uh, tweaking and tuning to the UI itself, but nothing hugely significant, obviously. So, there, Oh, there, uh, is, there, anyone? there is one one other feature to show, uh, since somebody in community was asking for it, the Runnels feature. Um, so one of the other things that, that got, got added is uh, the ability to do filters. Oh, there are no writable parameters right now. Um, to do filters right from the uh, list pages. So if I take a filter and I wanted, um, let's see, red icons, let's see, icon, uh, color, uh, blue icons. And I want to name that filter blue. So this will show me only only machines that have uh, blue icons. Yay! So you're going to see that it's filtered. Uh, I can undo the filter and see multiple multiple color icons. Yeah, there's the other colors, and then those filters are saved. So I can come in and say, oh, I only want the blue ones again. And now it's going to filter only the blue ones. Um, so it's one of the, this was a, a feature request to have, if you're editing your own things, like uh, if I was in workflows over here, and I only wanted to see workflows that I'd edited, I'm going to have to click. Um, let's see what's going on. Um, I could actually go through, build a filter, and then and cancel it. And one of the things that you'll start seeing is there's supposed to be writable filters on uh, things like writable only. So if you're building a whole bunch of stuff and you don't want to get distracted by the read only pieces that come in through content layers, you can, uh, you'll be able to pick read only or build filters just for your pieces. Um, and then all of the systems show their content. We also expose content layer. Ooh, so uh, in this case, like this information came in through the burn-in content pack. You actually can see that on all the pages for that. 
Oh, which also gets exposed um, if you hover over the locks. Some of this stuff is lurking as hovers to me. So at some point we need a guide that says, oh yeah, if you hover over this place, you can see where the content came from. It's only so much real estate to use otherwise. All right, now I'll pause for questions. I'm, I don't know if you kicked it over to me or not, Rob. My audio completely dropped out. I had to reconnect. I didn't, but I can. I'm okay. really waiting for questions. I didn't see any. No questions. Raise your hand now or forever hold your peace. <laughs> We're holding it to All right. Too bad. So sad. No more questions for you. Uh, all right. I'm going to cut over to uh, VMware ESXi content. And oops, hold on. Uh, all right, so in uh, we had previously uh, one or two, actually three, I think, um, sad ESXi boot M's that hadn't seen much love for a while and in some cases weren't working. So I spent a little bit of time cleaning up the uh, VMware ESXi content. Uh, that content used to live in the OS-other pack. Uh, I've created a new content pack called VMware, which has moved all of that content into it and uh, sort of absorbed all of the old content and has been increased to support currently today seven versions of VMware ESXi and added a bunch of capabilities to that. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to kick off just an install because it takes a few minutes, about uh, eight to nine minutes to do the install and then two three minutes to reboot into it. Uh, so I'm going to kick that off and I'll show uh, everybody sort of what's behind the scenes on making that work. Uh, right now I've got uh, 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 VMware's uh, Fusion hypervisor thingamajiggy running here on my Mac. I've got a VM in Sledgehammer and I'm going to go ahead and just kick it into uh, ESXi 670 update 1 install and let it kick in the background and it should pick up the installer straight in. So now we see it's loading into the 670U1 installer. All right, so what, what's going on behind the scenes besides the normal sort of boot M stuff uh, in the content? Um, my, the content is currently in, actually not even in tip yet. I just pushed a, a pull request, so it hasn't hit the tip yet. Oh, good. Greg pulled it in already. So. Content uh, is in tip, so you should start to see it in the catalog showing up. Um, there is uh, limited testing on some of it, so <laughs> if there are a few edges on it, I'm still working on the, the sharp pointy bits that might poke you, um, but uh, the basic provisioning works. So behind the, uh, uh, let's see, where are we, content packages. So behind the scenes, after you load it, I'm still running the old portal right here, but you'll see a new VMware content type uh, that provides the capabilities. Uh, essentially what it boils down to, uh, we're supporting now the ESXi 550U3B through 670U1 versions. Uh, there will be some capabilities for adding uh, vendor VIBs or vendor specific ISOs. Uh, if those are use case requirements, it's relatively easy to add those in uh, should those requirements, requirements be needed. Uh, but in addition to the uh, boot M's, I've included a number of default uh, workflows for each of the different versions of ESXi. Uh, that may be boilable down to a smaller pattern that you can selectively install an ESXi version with. Uh, I haven't finished that feature piece of it yet, but that will slim down the workflows necessary. The workflow is, is pretty simplified um, because in the VMware world, it's a, a closed appliance essentially. Uh, we're not able to compile today um, our runner or our agent to run on the ESXi environment. So post reboot from an install, uh, there will be no runner. So you can't do post reboot runner workflow capabilities today with ESXi. We have a few things that we may be working on in the future to make that happen, but today that's not the case. So all of the customization that you'll want to do needs to be done through modification of the kickstart configurations. 
Uh, so the workflow subsequently is pretty basic. There's uh, the ESXi install, which is the kickstart process and finish install and complete. The finished install process works by virtue of using Python uh, within the ESXi environment to fire off a uh, uh, notice to DRP to say, hey, mark the machine is completed, set the workflow and the stages appropriately, and uh, the boot env to local. So it'll, on the next reboot, it'll boot to the local installed uh, environment. Uh, so that's sort of the limited amount of interaction with DRP that we've uh, included there. If we take a look at templates, uh, I thought I had, I didn't pull it in, that's fine. Uh, within the templates, there is a primary ESXi uh, install kickstart uh, template for the 6.5 and newer, unfortunately, they've, well, fortunately slash unfortunately, they've changed Python to Python 3. So any Python code that you actually run has to be converted to Python 3. Uh, so we have a Py3 specific version. We do some of the basic stuff, set password to the standard, uh, default allow you to override if uh, possible. One of the future enhancements that I'll have uh, coming into this content pack is a little better control over uh, overriding disks and preserving uh, disks, either the install disk or the VMFS uh, volumes. Uh, and that's important specifically when you want to do upgrades since uh, ESXi has done a pretty decent job of allowing you to do uh, in-place upgrades uh, separate from your VMFS stores. Um, that's not currently supported today, but that'll be added in soon. Uh, there are three networking models that are supported in the content now. There is a DHCP model, which will just accept DHCP from your DHCP services. Uh, there is a convert model, which will take the DHCP uh, request and convert it to static IP assignments, so you're no longer dependent on DHCP. Um, I haven't added hooks yet in to uh, convert that to a reservation on the back end on DRP side, uh, since that's going to be some Python code to make that interaction work correctly. But the appropriate flow would be to convert to static and then mark that as a reservation so DRP knows that it's a reserved uh, instance. Uh, the third mode is manual, which allows you to predefine uh, configuration post reboot what the ESXi instance will be configured to, and that's what I'm actually using in the configuration right now example. Uh, so right now the machine is booting into uh, our boot, the network into the DHCP, it's getting 192.168.9.101. Post reboot it should get .201 as per the manual configuration. Uh, and then uh, there are a couple helper uh, templates that are installed. Um, the network kickstart uh, actually uh, interacts with a parameter to define whether it's DHCP static or manual configuration for the network configuration. I'll show that in a moment as well. Uh, and then you can set some other additional parameters for the manual to set the IP address, net mask, you know, default route, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we notified DRP that we've completed uh, in the uh, percent pre stage. Uh, and then we're going to preserve some of the log files that get destroyed after reboot. We save those off to the data store one in the VMFS. So post reboot, you can observe uh, the log files uh, during the installation process, which has been pretty uh, important for me to figure out what's happening since we don't get any feedback during the install uh, in ESXi that we're used to in job logs uh, because it's sort of a black box. Uh, and then we can enable the, the ESXi local shell or the SSH shell. If you enable the SSH shell, we'll do the same old standard pattern of injecting the access keys into ESXi, so remote SSH will be enabled into uh, the uh, ESXi instance for you, and that's controlled by a parameter as well. So you, the default behavior will be to not install, uh, enable those shells, but if you enable the the set the uh, shell, the remote shells to true, then it will enable those for you. Uh, which is a good pattern for dev test, not a good pattern for production necessarily. Uh, and then you can define any number of custom uh, kickstarts to inject to the pre, post, and first boot stanzas. So if you had some customizations, we added the hook in here so you can customize ESXi post install um, and during the install. So this gives you sort of a poor man's version of uh, customization that we would give you through full workflow. Uh, which gives you sort of a, a little bit more control and customization over the configuration environment. Uh, if we jump over to um, profiles, I created an ESXi settings profile that contains most of the parameters that I've referred to. Uh, so this sort of controls the configuration uh, for my 
uh, environment. In this case, I'm using the Kickstart custom config, so I'm injecting two uh, just playground test uh, scripts to verify that the, the uh, ad adding additional templates works. So in this case, a post Python interpreter and a pre BusyBox uh, section interpreter, which just creates a, a, a file on the file system just as a proof of concept that it injects those. And then we have our network DNS gateway hostname, IP address, netmask, etc. So these are in the case of the manual setting that I mentioned. So here's the manual setting. Uh, we'll use those values to define uh, the post reboot configuration. And then last, I mentioned the uh, shell local shell remote. So setting these two uh, parameters to true will enable the shells and open up the firewall for SSH access uh, post reboot so you can SSH into the machine. Um, one little hook just for testing added is the uh, VMware tools uh, module is about a half of the entire install size of ESXi itself. And since I'm doing test ground in a vir um, virtual machine environment, I don't care about the tools. And so that just speeds up the install process a little bit. Uh, by default, uh, the tools may be installed. It's also uh, quite possible in a lot of environments, your tools packages will be hosted in a VMFS store or uh, remotely in HTTP environment somewhere else uh, to interact with your virtual machine bring up process. Uh, so that may be useful in a production environment in some cases. Uh, so that's sort of it in a nutshell. If we come back over here, we'll see that our machine has actually been uh, reset. Uh, it's uh, tripped on the uh, DRP uh, notify process. So it set the workflow to not set stage none, boot M to local. So on reboot, it'll boot back into ESXi, uh, at which point we lose control over it and, until we reboot it. Uh, and set the machine to do something else in, in workflow uh, to transition it back to say discovery or uh, another fresh install. Uh, so that's sort of the primary pieces um, there that are in existence today. There are a number of features as we move forward and enhancing things that I think will be added in. I have a, a relatively long list of things to add uh, depending on use case uh, feedback and requirements. Um, if for interest, um, the kickstart that gets rendered uh, is based on our standard dynamic rendering for Compute KS, in this case is the kickstart. This is essentially what it ends up looking like, uh, kickstart stuff. Once it's all pieced together, we get our interpreters, uh, pre-interpreter, busy box, et cetera, uh, and then the fancy Python uh, hooks for calling back to DRP to mark the machine, uh, which we saw uh, happen already. Uh, workflow value is set to empty, uh, stage set to none, and, and boot M set to local. It's how we make the call back to DRP to, to say, hey, we're done with all of this. And then you'll see uh, a lot of the other pieces down here. Uh, most importantly, or more interestingly for some people, I think, is the, um, I gotta move that out of the way, you can't see that, uh, is adding the, the sort of the custom injection. So here's the simple uh, one of the simple tests, so this is the pre-BusyBox interpreter, uh, which does the uh, writing out to a, a log file just as a proof of concept. So you can dynamically add additional templates into your kickstart to do interesting things. Uh, and here's a Python version as well. So we call a little bit of Python code to just uh, write uh, uh, to a file with a, a timestamp, et cetera. And, and that's sort of the proof of concept test there. Uh, if we look back at our machine, it's still grinding along. It looks like it's going to take longer because I think Zoom is chewing my machine up and this VM is four gig of memory and my uh, uh, laptop's not particularly happy uh, with Chrome, Zoom, and installing <laughs> ESXi. Uh, but it does complete up and finish, reboots back into ESXi, uh, sets up the SSH keys, and then everything's done from there. Um, that's sort of uh, a brief whirlwind tour of uh, some of the updated ESXi code and, and work. Um, we're really interested in any feedback if somebody starts using it on physical hardware. Going from a virtualized environment to physical hardware always uh, exposes um, rough edges sometimes or problems with the install uh, environment, uh, particularly uh, there'll be issues when folks have custom hardware, we'll need to be able to 
uh, add in custom vibs for the uh, kernel modules for uh, drivers, you know, for example, Mellanox, Nix, or something like that. Um, I have those patterns in my to-do list. They haven't been added in yet to, to make the content generic to support that, but that'll be one of the bigger things as we go into more production deployments with the content. Uh, so there it goes. It's finally kicking over in the background and uh, should be um, booting up into ESXi, hopefully. Fingers crossed. Um, I think the DHCP is going to time out because it's set to manual, so the Not sure why it's spinning right now, but it should kick into ESXi. Uh, any questions, thoughts, comments, feedback, etc.? There it goes. Did, and it takes a few minutes on first boot. And one of the one of the other things is a stage to do a certain amount of machine validation. Yeah. Oh, so there there is. Um, one of the requests and one of the, the work we're doing is to be able to do some vSAN and ESXi hardware compatibility list uh, validation. So there's a, a number of stages and, and actually there's a workflow that goes with it that is uh, VMware HCL checks. So the HCL check runs the ESXi HCL install and HCL validate the vSAN HCL install and validate steps. Uh, so theoretically, what that'll do ultimately is do the HCL check against uh, VMware's HCL API and come back with an answer and say, hey, yes, this machine is validated as uh, hardware that's compatible for either ESXi or vSAN appropriately. These are kind of stub functions right now uh, because most of the tooling that exists to do the uh, HCL validate steps are very Windows-centric and require you to also have a vCenter instance already running and your ESXi host already running to do the validation against, which makes no sense from a bootstrap perspective of a new, fresh new environment where you don't have vCenter, you don't have ESXi running yet, and you wanna gate the, the decision on whether or not to install ESXi or vSAN. Uh, so I'm working right now with VMware, I have a couple resources internally with VMware to get some tooling done to do this uh, SANS vCenter and ESXi existence, uh, so a pre-ESXi environment uh, will be able to get uh, installed and validated uh, for the HCL tooling. Um, that'll that'll be a little while until we get through some of the, they have to create some tools and process for that. Uh, their API gateway is not a quote-unquote public accessible, it's only accessible for tools they write and they don't have any tooling that works in Sledgehammer environment right now. Uh, cleanly without the existence of vCenter. So, so like I said, there's some stub stuff there. Um, it'll be a little while before those are finished, um, but that is in process. Uh, and we see the machines kicked back and we'll see it's been a statically assigned the .201 address. Uh, theoretically, if I, um, oh, that's not gonna work because that's wrong address, we go. So boom, we logged into it. My key was injected, so I was able to log in SSH access keyless, and I renamed the host machine to ESX, uh, uh, oh, that was a typo, ESX CLI one manual, but that's the host name and the parameter I set. So there it is. Uh, okay. Any questions, comments, feedback? I want to move over to talking about Ansible stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm excited. Yeah. I'm shutting this thing down because it's chewing my machine up big time. Okay. Uh, well, then okay, let's I, move I, over. I, I can. Yeah. Let me. Let me. Ugh. I don't know if I, we can do it in, in the, in here and then I can bring up the code if we need to. Um, but actually I would turn it over. So we had, we had somebody in community asking about Ansible integrations, um, which is something that we, we actually haven't touched for a year. 
perhaps longer because the last commit I saw was 2017. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I wouldn't need, so, so it, Shane, if you want to bring something up, uh, go to digital rebar provision in GitHub and under the integrations tab, there is a, um, directory there with some Python code in it. Integrations, Ansible. No, you moved it. No, that's provision content. I did move it. To, go to it is in its own um, um, uh, it's somewhere. But it's it's in the digital rebar provision is is the integrations piece. I think I think it's the rack the rack and content repo has the uh, library. Ah, okay. This, so this, and then this is the thing that's actually interesting, not the not the coop spray um, content pack. Yeah. So so here's what here's what happens. Um, Ansible needs an inventory file to run. It's, it's inherent in how Ansible's designed, and that inventory file has to have a has to have as a minimum a list of all the machines that you have SSH keys for. So, so Rebar's really good at being able to create machines, put your SSH key on them so you have access, and then you can use our APIs, which this does, to produce a list of the machines in that inventory. So if that's what that's basically all this, this Python does. Is it goes to the Rebar APIs, and then it dumps out all the machines in a Ansible inventory pattern. Um, uh, from the profiles. So this is where it gets weird, and this is why I wanted to talk about it. Um, and I'm hoping to get some community input uh, because me doing it without a lot of use cases is translates into nothing, you know, into something that's, that's not useful by anybody. Um, so, and that, there's two attempts for this. There's one. This is the original attempt, and then there's the other inventory file. Don't don't switch to it yet. Where we tried to get smarter. Um, as part of the coop spray interactions. So basically what this is going to do is it's just going to pull all the machines and then create a hosts list in, in Ansible inventories. Um, yeah, it does, I mean, which, is, which is fine. And that's super handy if, if all of the machines that you have in digital rebar, you want them in a single inventory file, which is not what we wanted for coop spray. Um, so most Ansible playbooks require machines to be in groups, um, what, what they call groups, what we would sort of call profiles, but profiles didn't map that well into the groups concept. Um, and so uh, that this is, this is where it starts to get wonky. Um, it would be possible to take this file, you know, and then group, group things based on a parameter, based on being in a profile, based on uh, something, to pre create the groups that you need to then cause a, a reasonable inventory file to be built. If you, if the, if you, the coop spray, what we did was we said, ah, that's confusing. And we, we, pre we created a profile with the groups in it. Um, and that actually got pretty ugly. So, and this is why this is confusing to people. So if you want to use the other, now go, please jump to the other inventory page. So this inventory and profile via profiles, which is actually documented in the coop spray, that one, in the coop spray Ansible docs, it shows um, how, to, how to create this. But this one, you actually put machines, lists of machines in a profile, and then it uses those lists of machines to generate the inventory file just of those machines. Does that make sense? So basically, it's you're 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 using you're you're putting groups. You're using the rebar profiles to create groups in parameters, and then we had some UX that was supposed to help you build those things up. Um, it, it's 
it's fine if you like the UX, but anybody who's trying to build a profile any other way is going to get frustrated really fast. Um, so I, since we had a question about this today, and this is really old, I want to go, go back to the community and say, do you care? Um, if you do care, what, what would, you know, what type of groups do you want to build? Um, and how would you want to pick the groups out of the system? Um, pooling, <laughs> add it in with a pooling plugin. Uh, pooling, so and we, we, we probably need to go back and do a, a update on, on pooling. But I mean, pooling is gonna just give you the machines that are in pools, and you could do that. Uh, you could, you could, you could. Um, interesting, I mean, and like I have a, a, a prototype of a rack plugin that create, puts machines in racks. We could create one that did sim, something similar for Ansible with the API extensions and put, puts things into Ansible groups. Um, Huh. So there's one uh, one idea for enhancing is to use use the pooling um, mechanism to define pools of groups to apply Ansible and playbooks against. Um, but re really, um, well, if anyone in community has thoughts on this as well, we're definitely interested in hearing how you'd like to operate that for those of you that are Ansible shop users, obviously. So long time no speak. You can, I can hear you. Check, check. Check, check. So hi, it's Will. Um, <laughs> Will Dennis. We, I know it's been a long time. Holy Toledo. Hey. I know. Welcome back. So, here's my question: Is is Ansible only usable with the uh, the licensed version? No. Okay. Ansible just uses the. It depends on how you're doing it, but it only uses right, right. The, the API. So it's a it's just a Python call to the APIs. If we mm -hmm. if we trigger it off of a, some plugin data. That would move it into you need the licenses to use that plugin. Right. So pooling is a plugin, right? Pooling, pooling is a plugin. Is a plugin yeah. yeah. So that would be like if you use pooling and that's the one way, then uh, buy a license, right? So, um, so I, I'd be interested, obviously, in enabling this for open source use um, or non licensed or whatever you want to call it. But the, the which is where it's at thing, today. Yeah. The challenging thing is uh, getting the inventory and maybe putting it in one group is probably simplistic. But um, doing the whole groups of groups thing, or or taking the inventory and say this is a controller and these are minions, so two groups, and then to join both those groups into an upper level group. Yeah, that would be. I, I, it strikes me as you'd have to put some Ansible specific attributes in your your uh, yeah. machine, and that's that's where we ended up before. So I mean, we could. It's it wouldn't be a, a big deal to put a parameter list, in, like an Ansible groups parameter on a machine and then say this machine is in these groups and then build it up from there. Right. Um, those, what, what we found is those, that approach doesn't scale very well without doing API extensions, which is where pooling ended up. Um, yeah. Like you can track those things all you want, but then doing them in, you know, for more than a couple of machines becomes really hard. Um, and so we end up, like with pooling, uh, the pooling we did first was just a, it still is, a parameter on a machine um, that indicated the machine was in a pool or not. Uh, it's just, and we, that we could do that. Um, I mean, that would be the way to, and then, and then you would end up with, uh, 
it strikes me as better to um, do an API extension, create a groups concept as an API extension, put machines in those groups, which is really what happens with tools and racks for those plugins. Right. And then query, and then you query those to get the data, which is actually very similar to what I originally built a year ago. I just was stuffing that that into the profiles under a parameter, which is really right. Hmm? That's true. Profiles, the same thing. It's the same thing. So, and it's an ar arbitrarily the deepness of nesting is arbitrary or? Nesting becomes really, really hard. Um, yeah. And and I, I have, you know, all the feels about Ansible's inventory files from that perspective. Um, it's, it's one of those patterns that gets, makes it very hard to build, you know, sustainable patterns when you nest things really deeply like that. Yeah, it's I don't know, how, how deeply do you do your playbooks? I, I, can, I can go three or four sometimes uh, to do different collections of things that are part of a whole. I'm trying to think back. Uh, you know, we, we have uh, research group collections, which then have different machine groups that have functions and we use a HPC scheduler named Slurm. So I have Slurm controllers and Slurm workers and Slurm login nodes. So all, like those three groups would be nested in all Slurm machines, which are nested in this department because the departments have different software collections I apply to them. Uh -huh. So yeah, this I can go a couple deep for pretty good reasons, you know? And I don't uh, see how I could do otherwise. What I'm, what I'm so we, we sort of avoid that pattern with profiles being, staying flat. I mean, conceivably you could take a, you could put metadata in a profile that would create a hierarchy. Mm -hmm. This would, this would, my, my preference in, in any of this would be to use profiles to um, be your groups, but they, they don't map to Ansible because they are parallel and you, you end up, there, there's no hierarchy. Yeah, yeah, right, right. The same. And maybe does Ansible care if you have the machine in the same, the same machine in multiple groups? Uh, it's, no, you can put the same machine in multiple groups. Um, it's more like if you're applying uh, different configs to collections, like all the members of this collection get this fig, and then this subset of that collection gets this additional config, and then this one has a special role, and it might be one or n machines in that collection. So I, I don't know if you could flatten it out very well. Yeah. This, this to me is, is where my, my instinct was to use profiles as the map profiles to groups. And then if you needed anything more complex, which I think is pretty much what's there, then to say, you know, pull requests accepted. Right. Solve on that. the problem and share. <laughs> well, it's, I mean, it's, this is. No, it is. I mean, it's open source, so. Fair enough. It's, we don't, we don't, we do have customers who are using Tower and Ansible Tower, but that actually runs Ansible jobs per machine. It's designed to be done on a like machine by machine basis. We actually circumvent this whole problem. And that's, that Yeah, I haven't really used well. Tower for a long, we use Tower till they dramatically raise the price on it. And I haven't, I tried to get AWX running in Docker, but it, yeah. it crapped out somehow. I haven't revisited that. And it's, we're doing fine with using CLI Ansible. Um, so I don't think we need all the AWXE frosting because we're a small org. We don't need like our back for Ansible. So, and I, I don't know, unfortunately, I'm ignorant how like Chef handles 
things or puppet handle. You guys know Chef, right? So how does Chef, do you do collections? Can you nest collections or do any of that? Um, been way, way long, even longer well, since I've used Chef. Okay. Uh, I, I thought you oh, guys, I've never used Chef, so I just, I figure it has to be a thing, right? To have groups of groups, or is that just literally specific, Ansible specific? Uh, so this is, I think, uh, it's not Ansible specific. It, it's a question of whether or not it's a, it's the best pattern for building workflows the, the way we've been trying to accomplish it. But as soon as those, those, those facts get really deep, they obfuscate, they, you know, they're, they're, they become abstractions that obfuscate what's happening and then they're very hard to make composable. Um, and that's part of the reason why, for me, it's, it's, it's not that valuable. If, if I'm if I'm installing Kubernetes with Kube Spray and I've got a three and we're, we're going to have to get off the call. Um, Shane, tell you what, we can hold this and keep talking and then bring it, you know, bring it up in another. Um, yeah, Will, yeah we'd, we'd be happy to revisit a little bit more next uh, meetup as well uh, or oh, community chat as well. Um, but yeah. we, it's definitely an interesting topic to solve. Um, and obviously requires a little bit of discussion around people's use cases to get right. Yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to take up a bunch of time. No, this is no worries. This is the conversation we wanted to have. It, you're you're hitting the the reason why I can't just come up with a simple solution is there's right. a mapping problem, and we have deliberately architected the product to avoid this mapping problem. And now and someone so, wants to go there. <laughs> and so, well, if, if yeah, if anything we do turns into, um, which is, it's a problem for Ansible too. It, it becomes a, 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 a main. Thing. And so there's just no, no easy thing. Yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. Unfortunately we do. I should have, should have played my zoom a little bit better, but we have another call coming in. So I'm going to, Else. Yeah, so that concludes version 34 of Digital Rebar Provision Meetup. Thank you very much, everybody. We'll talk to you later. <laughs>